Please open in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4. If you stand, I'll be reading verses 11 through 16 of Ephesians 4 as we really consider what it means to uh, have a church that is led by elders and yet in concert with the congregation in such a way that the saints are equipped for the works of service. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Please be seated. John Piper describes spiritual leadership or defines spiritual leadership this way. He says spiritual leadership may be defined as knowing where God wants people to be and taking initiative to use God's methods to get them there in reliance upon God's power. The answer to where God wants people to be is in a spiritual condition and in a lifestyle that display his glory and honor his name. That's important for us to understand that the church is not defined by the culture or the trends of our day. The New Testament lays down specific guidelines for church leadership, which must be followed so that God will be properly glorified in his church. Now, there's certainly room for different kinds of emphasis within the New Testament leadership structure, but each church must be clear on how it will flesh out that structure. So what we'll see this morning is that Jesus is the head of his church, which is organized into local congregations led by a qualifi qualified plurality of elders who communicate with and are accountable to the believing membership. Say it again, the Lord Jesus is the head of his church, which is organized into local congregations led by a qualified plurality of elders who communicate with and are accountable to the believing membership. Elders and congregation work together for a healthy church. Now last week, as we really finished up with Matthew 16, uh, we'd spent a lot of time on the verses 16 through 19, we began really our series on the distinctives. So flowing out of the reality of the church called to gather together to really affirm believe that those who are believers and be in charge of overseeing the purity of that church, well, we, we began to look into the idea of, well, the apostles were originally called to begin the church, so who is doing that now? And so we're now moving on to these distinctives. And what we're talking about as far as elder leadership is not all drawn from Matthew 16. In fact, really some of the varying interpretations of that have little to do with elder authority or the nature of eldership within the local church. That's really a, a separate uh, uh, topic that we are beginning to discuss now. But really what we did last week was lay the foundation for eldership. Where do elders come from? Why do we have elders in a church? Why don't we have apostles and prophets still today? So how did that handoff happen? What happened? So we really talked about the foundation for eldership and the relationship of the apostles to the elders. And we saw that the apostles essentially functioned as the first elders. And we'll see that again this morning, that as they began the church in Jerusalem, that those, the, the uh, 12 apostles, really the 11, then adding on Matthias, they really functioned in an elder capacity, even while they still functioned as apostles. And as that church grew, we'll see in, in for example, in, in uh, Acts 15, that they, were, they added elders into that congregation as leaders, while they still retained authority as apostles. So the apostles functioned as the first elders, even as they had a special authority as apostles themselves. Now, the apostles then we saw appointed elders. We saw that there were elders existing in the New Testament churches, that they were directly appointed by the apostles as they would then begin the churches by the preaching and teaching of the word. People would believe, they would be baptized, they would enter into the particular church in a city. Remember, there was one church per city in the early church. And then the apostles would come back through and establish leadership. In fact, we saw in the book of Titus that Paul had left a particular area, the island of Crete, and he then assigned Titus, kind of his apostolic emissary, to go back to that island and establish elders in every city. Elders, plural, as we'll see, always a plurality of leadership, not one person, but that those elders were established by the apostles and that a church really wasn't considered to be finished or complete. Remember in Titus it says, set in order what remains. 
These are churches that need to really become full-fledged churches by having the appointment of that plurality of elders. We, uh, we saw in the New Testament direct, direct appeals to the elders of churches in the writing of the, of the epistles, as well as in Acts where Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders, calls them really to the beach where he's going to be and gives them a charge. And then we saw instruction given to the churches concerning submission to the leadership of those churches. So that's kind of our foundation. The, the apostles handed off the, the work of leading and directing the church to a plurality of elders who then do not have the same authority and mandate as the apostles or the prophets, and yet they work in concert with the congregation to accomplish the work of, that God has given as Christ builds his church. So the apostles are replaced by elders. All the elders, those who originally, or those who saw the risen Christ, were commissioned by Christ and then, be, and then established, the, they laid the foundation for the churches. They all died, Apostle John being the last one to die, 90 to 95 AD, somewhere in there. And then those apostles were permanently replaced by a plurality of elders with a different level of authority, and also with a, a different function within the church. So first, as, as we move on to our outline, let's talk about the work and authority of elders. And what we're doing is we're really talking about the distinctives of Grace Community Church. And what's a distinctive? Well, the distinctives essentially are those things that are not directly in the doctrinal statement. That is, if you come to our new members class, we'll work our way through the doctrinal statement, the things that you must believe essentially to say, I, I'll, I'll join the church. I agree with those things in your doctrinal statement. And those are things that you have to agree upon in order to enter into membership. Our distinctives then are the things that you will be taught, right? Along with that doctrinal statement, the distinctives are things which you don't have to hold to necessarily in order to join the church, but you have to be willing to hear these things taught. You might be undecided in some of these areas, you might not have thought through some of these areas, and yet you need to be able to hear these things taught. Good and godly men in other churches might disagree with some of our distinctives. We hope they don't disagree with much of our doctrinal statement. <laughs> they might disagree with some of the distinctives, and yet this, these are the distinctives that, that we hold. And we agree then as elders not to teach against these things and to direct and, and, and our, our church pursues the course underneath these particular distinctives. So they are important that you know what they are. And they do set us apart to some degree from other churches. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is not only something that, is, it, that happens by the nature of having distinctives, but it, it is a good thing from the standpoint of as different churches work their way through things like these distinctives and their doctrinal statements, then the church is refined. It continues to pursue truth. And so we're not dictated to by a cultural norm or by what other churches are doing. We seek to look into the scriptures and in the best possible way pursue the truth than w in, uh, from what we discover in the pages of scripture. So those, those are our distinctives, things that good and godly men may disagree upon, but that we as a church pursue and that we feel and, and are convinced we believe as elders are necessary for the best possible growth of the church. That's very important. These distinctives that we have flow out of our doctrinal statement, and they, we, we are convinced that these are what are necessary so that the church can grow and, and be equipped to its fullest extent, which is why then when other churches don't hold these distinctives, Although we wouldn't say, and, and, and there's, a, there's a very careful way that we try to look at other churches and determine at what level are they following the truths of Scripture. But if they don't hold the, the, to these particular distinctives, we would say, look, there's a difference that we think is not, is not as good as what we're doing here at Grace. Why? Because these are the things that we're convinced will bring us to full maturity. The things that, that Scripture teaches about how a church comes to, to have the full fruit necessary. And so by nature, we would then say, no, we don't th think those things are as good. Otherwise, we would be doing that, right? If, if, a, if, we, if we feel like what another church is doing as they are helping their, their congregation come to the fullness of maturity in Christ, if we, if we thought that was the best thing to do, we'd be doing it. These are the things that we're doing because we're convinced that Scripture demands them, essentially, and that they are the best thing for the church as a whole. One of those things then has to do with the nature of elder and congregational concert, how we work together. So the work and authority of elders essentially is this. First, the elders do not have the authority of apostles or prophets. We've talked about that. I discussed that last week. Right? They don't have the same direct authority that was given to the apostles. They are not part of the foundation of the church, and they do not speak direct revelation from God as the prophets. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 is clear. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That, that foundation was laid. It is not being laid anymore. Elders are not laying it. The congregation is not laying it. 
It's already done. And so we build upon that. Essentially, that's the work of the apostles and prophets in the first century, then left to us in word uh, as we have the closed canon of Scripture. That is all the books of Scripture, all the instruction that we need finished out with the apostles and the prophets. So then elders oversee the equipping work of the church underneath the mediation certainly of Christ as the head of the church, and then the word of God that was left behind, written by the apostles and prophets, Old Testament prophets, and then New Testament apostles and prophets. We then, the elders, take that truth and essentially are are mediating it to the congregation, even as the congregation studies and works its way through that truth as well. So the elders are then given to oversee that equipping work on the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets with, of course, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, the ultimate foundation, the one whose person, work, and teaching undergird everything that the church does. And that's what we saw in Ephesians 4. He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the works of service to the building up of the body of Christ. We don't have apostles any longer. The apostles and prophets worked together. Again, prophets speaking direct revelation, and we'll discuss that next week. So what we have now are the evangelists and pastors and teachers, and they work in concert. Those two aren't a hierarchy of evangelists over pastors and teachers in that sense, but they work together to see that further churches are established and that those churches are then built up and equipped for the works of service. We see a similar thing in 1 Peter 5, where Peter, as an apostle and also as an elder, says this, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you. Right? So there's a shepherding function, exercising oversight. That's the authority necessary to accomplish the work of equipping. And it says not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, which is the principles of scripture. The elders don't do this on their own. They don't decide what they're gonna do. They don't build the church according to their own ideas. That's according to the will of God, which is laid out for us completely all the revealed will of God that we need in the truth of the scriptures. Goes on to say they don't do that for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over the flock. So what are the things that the elders do in that equipping work? Well, they oversee the teaching of sound doctrine. They are to teach sound doctrine, and then they are to oversee and make sure that in every place where teaching goes forth, that there's a proper presentation of the word of God. That would be from the nursery all the way up to the seniors ministry, everywhere it is the elder's responsibility, not only to preach and teach themselves, but also to make sure that anyone who is preaching and teaching does so according to the principles of scripture, properly explained and understood. This is vital, Titus 1.9. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able, this is the elder's role, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. This is the role of the elders of a church. And so uh, it would make perfect sense that anyone who's going to teach in the church receives in one sense a higher level of accountability and scrutiny from the elders. That is coming into Grace Community Church to teach is going to be a rigorous process. It's not something going to be something that just happens because the teaching of the word of God is paramount and it has to be correct anywhere where it's done. A small group Bible study, the nursery as I mentioned, if you are presenting the truths of the word of God, you have to be doing that properly because anything that is taught that is untrue and linked to scripture is devastating. If our young kids are learning things and say, the Bible teaches this, and that's an improper interpretation of scripture, you're building into the very foundation of their understanding things that are not true. And so it is vital that at every place, the word of God is properly taught, improper or unsound doctrine is refuted, and everyone who is seeking to, to, to live and work and teach in sound doctrine is encouraged. Elders oversee the teaching of sound doctrine. They also oversee the sending out of evangelists. That is the ongoing work of the church as it continues to perpetuate itself through the centuries. Acts uh, 13, it's fascinating. Verses one through three, go ahead and turn there. So we'll we'll do a little Bible drill this morning. So go to Acts and we'll give you a chance to look through these passages. In Acts 13, again, here you have the early church. You have the church in Antioch, which essentially was the first major church established after the church in Jerusalem. It says, now that we're at Antioch, Acts 13, verse one, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. This is fascinating. Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. What you have going on in the early church is, again, you had apostles, prophets, and then you have evangelists and pastors and teachers, and they're working together in concert. Here in in the church at Antioch, you don't have any apostles, right? Uh, They're not directly functioning that way, right? And, And you've got Saul who is there, 
right, who has been commissioned by God, but he is acting, it would appear here, in his function as a prophet and as a teacher. And you have those two together. They're not the same. That's very important for our discussion next week. Prophets and teachers are not the same. Prophets are hearing directly from God and giving those words to the congregation for the purpose of building them up. They were absolutely necessary in the first century because you didn't have the fullness of Scripture in order to exhort the people. And so prophets would hear directly from God, and under the authority, the overlying authority of the apostles, they would give that, those prophetic words, again, which weren't simply foretelling things, but also foretelling truth that the people needed. Combined, they were also then teachers. What were they teaching? They were teaching Old Testament scriptures, any of the New Testament scriptures which they had, the gospels and other things as they were being written, and then also teaching what was being spoken by the apostles and prophets. Those things which were absolutely true the very words of God spoken through those men, then the teachers would teach those things and they were working in concert, right? And that happened because there were still apostles and prophets. And so there were teachers along with them. And here's what they did while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which, for which I've called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they were part of then sending out evangelists to go to preach and to teach and to establish further churches. So without prophets today, we would say the pastors and teachers who are the, the elders who are overseeing the churches are then responsible to send out, to identify under the, the power of the Spirit of God and the truth of the Word of God, they're responsible to identify those who should go out and continue to build churches to preach the gospel and see people coming to Christ. See, elders oversee the equipping of the saints for the works of service and in a more general sense. Now this includes more than just preaching and teaching. It involves the establishment and direction of the ministries of the church in which the equipping of the saints takes place. Now go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 5. This is really important. Because some would say the only thing elders do is preach and teach, and their only authority, in one sense, comes when they are preaching and teaching the word of God. Well, I mean, certainly that's the primary authority anywhere. But then there also needs to be some level of authority in which the leaders of the church say, these are the kinds of ministries that we're going to do. Here's what makes these good and godly ministries. Here's what would, would uh, enable these ministries to be effective. And they make decisions about those things. And in 1 Timothy 5, we see kind of this division of elder leadership. 1 Timothy 5, Paul says, beginning in verse 17, it says, the elders who rule well are considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. This is really important. You've got two things going on here. Uh, really, the general thing is that the elders are ruling. That is, they are overseeing the work of the church. They have the authority to oversee that. Within that work of ruling or overseeing the ministries of the church, you have a portion of that function, which is what? Preaching and teaching. And it is those who have that work, who are, are spending the majority of the time preaching and teaching that can be, that have the right, as it were, to do that while being paid. That is the worthy of double honor. But notice it, this is not saying right, that there are elders who preach and teach, and then there are elders who are really good at preaching and teaching. Some work hard and some don't. No, no, it's saying that there are a group of elders, some of them it is their job to work hard at preaching and teaching. The other elders, that's not their primary function. All elders must be gifted to preach and teach. But that is not all elders' primary function within the church. And those for whom that becomes their primary function on the basis of their giftedness, if the church has availability, then it is seen as a good thing for them to allow those elders to do that work while being paid so they can focus on it. But that doesn't mean that all the elders are doing that. So what are the other elders doing? They're overseeing the rest of the functions of, of the work of the ministry and making directions and giving uh, uh, direction to the, the work of the ministry that goes forward. That is all of the work that's necessary from Ephesians 4 in the equipping of the saints for the works of service. Any activity which is designed to equip the saints comes under the job description of the elders to oversee. It doesn't mean they lead every ministry. It simply means they have to oversee how those ministries go forward, making sure both the preaching within them and the structure and function of them is according, is being acted according to biblical principles. So this would extend to issues that are not directly biblically commanded, things like, things like service times. We're going to meet at 9 o'clock. Well, I mean, the congregation say, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Somebody's got to choose who we meet. So the elders say, look, we're going to meet at this time. The particular ministries we have, we're going to have these ministries. And as we'll see, all this is in concert with the congregation, talking through, working through, considering the giftedness. But somebody makes a decision about how these things will go forward. What kind of material will we use? How will we undergo or how will we have the outworking of our evangelism? We're going to go on the UT campus. Well, who decides that kind of thing? We're going to go door to door. We're going to spend time doing certain things. Well, again, 
it, the, in the biggest picture, the elders are overseeing those things as well. Now, I think we see a good example of this in Acts chapter 6, so turn there. Remember, all this is just as the church is starting out. And these, in, in the book of Acts, we have pictures, really. We have the historical narratives, which don't themselves flesh out the principles, but kind of give us an, an idea of how the early church was operating upon principles of leadership. So in Acts chapter 6, and really here, remember, it's the church in Jerusalem, which, by the way, was probably a church of close to 20,000 people, probably at least. Huge church led by 12 guys. Now, they were apostles, so they, they were pretty incredible. Right, and it seems like they added on some additional elders after that. But we're not talking hundreds of elders and hundreds of apostles here. And, and so really it seems that the apostles are functioning as the early eldership of the church. And here's what happens in Acts 6. It says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, my heavens, were they? You got 3,000, 2,000, so you've got 5,000. It says their number's increasing daily in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. This church is exploding all over the, all over the city of Jerusalem. It says, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, the care of widows is commended. It's commanded in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy, very clearly, to care for the widows in the church is, is a command. But exactly how you do that is not commended. So who's going to decide? You've got this complaint. Some widows are being overlooked. You have to work out the complaint. Is it really true? What's going on? How do we deal with it? Well, those things are not directly commanded in Scripture. They're not something that they, you know, the apostles could say, well, as Scripture says, you know, get a group of men, have them serve the tables. It doesn't exactly say that. And so the apostles functioning, I'm convinced here as elders, say this. They summon the congregation of disciples. They said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Not that serving tables is a bad thing. In fact, it's an honorable thing. They choose powerful men to do this, but the elders have been given a different role to preach and teach and pray. It's another part of their role. So they say, look, it's not desirable that we do that. And, and, and by the way, they didn't mean for themselves. You know, we don't want to serve. It's not desirable for the church. It's not good for the church as a whole if we stop preaching and teaching. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Why seven? Maybe because they like the number. It's, you know, it's certainly, and there's reasons maybe from the Old Testament they think it's a, a great or a perfect whatever. But yes, there's no biblical mandate. They said seven. That's what we, that seems to be enough to fit the need, whatever it might be. And then it says, they need to be full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. I do think that's important. Who's the we? The we are the elders, the apostles here of the church. So you select them. They, they gave that to the congregation to do, but they said, we're going to put them over. It's our authority that does that as you choose them. Verse four, but we will devote ourselves to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. And I love verse five, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. They didn't vote and say, we're gonna do what the elder said. We're gonna do what the apostle said. Are we gonna get seven men? Are we gonna do this? It just said, hey, we agree. It found approval with everybody. The elders have said this, this is a need clearly. And so we're gonna go do this. You see the elders working in concert with the congregation. And I'm going to look, I'm gonna point at that over and over and over. They're working together with the elders leading and so they, they find the seven men, right? And they choose Stephen and uh, a man full of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Par, uh, Parmenas, Nic Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And, and these they brought, verse six, before the apostles. Again, so they said, look, we choose them, but then they're bringing them back to the apostles to give the authorization. And after praying, they laid their hands on them. So we see that there are things going on that the elders are overseeing that are not directly commanded in scripture, but are a function of living out scriptural commands like caring for the widows. And the elders say, this is the mode, this is the way that we're gonna get that done. They says, okay, we agree with that, it looks great. So, so they were part of that. They bring these guys back to the elders. The elders commission them and send them out to do this work of serving tables. What a beautiful picture of harmony in the early church. Well, the el elders also oversee then uh, the protection of the body from destructive influences the protection of the body from destructive influences. So we, we've seen that they oversee the teaching of sound doctrine, oversee the sending out of evangelists, oversee the equipping of the saints for the works of service, and then they oversee the protection of the body from destructive influences. Turn to Acts chapter 20. And here we see the elders specifically commissioned to do this, the elders of a particular church. So if you wondered, well, all right, Chris, you know, maybe the guys in, in Acts are functioning as apostles and that's not exactly what elders do. Well. Again, I think you see those same, same commands given then to the elders of churches. And here very specifically, we have an apostle commissioning a group of elders to oversee 
the, the protection of the body from destructive influences. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And, and the, the context here is he's, uh, Paul is saying farewell to the elders of Ephesus. He couldn't get to uh, the, the city of Ephesus where he ministered for almost three years. So as he's, he's going by, the closest he can get is the beach there, uh, Miletus. He says, look, elders, come and join me all here on the beach where, right before I get on the boat, and I've got some last words for you. And in verse 28, he says this, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the flock of God among you. Excuse me, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So here, again, the, the elders are being given this commission to shepherd, to oversee, to care for the church of God. And it would be, that, certainly that's universal, but in this case, the church of God at Ephesus, this specific local congregation, which he purchased with his own blood. This is his. It's not yours, elders. It's not mine, says Paul. It's Christ's. It's God's. He purchased it with the blood of Christ. He says, verse 29, because I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, I, I think the elder group, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So among the church, among the leadership, they, they had to be incredibly careful that these wolves were not allowed to harm the congregation. And so they are to guard against the wolves. As we already saw in, in Titus 1.9, they refute false doctrine and then I, I think it's clear that they also direct church discipline. Say, so turn to Matthew 18, and we'll study this in detail later. And I've alluded to it several times already. But in Matthew 18, you have a church discipline situation. And there you have the entire congregation gathered. Okay, so they come together. They, they were, they're trying to determine if someone has asked properly for forgiveness. He says, verse 16, if he doesn't listen to you, after an initial confrontation, take one or more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. All right, so this, this church gathered that's involved in church discipline. And, and so there is, the, again, there's, 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 a, has, there's been a process that has been worked through here to get to the point where the church is then informed about the nature of, of church discipline going on. We would call this really step three. Step one has been done, an individual, then two or three went, and now the church is being told, not that the person is being put out, the church is being told to go call that person to repentance. So the whole church is now involved. But the idea, and some would say, well, well see, it's the whole church that has to agree, or they, they vote to say we should have church discipline. That's not the picture here at all. They're coming together. This has already been decided that this person has not repented. The church is then being called to say, look, go tell them to repent. So uh, I think the pretty clearly from the rest of the New Testament is the leadership that has worked through this issue then bringing it to the congregation so that they all are informed, right? But it's certainly it's not the congregation gathered to determine, hey, let's decide if this person has repented or not on that, from that initial standpoint. That is, first one went, two or three went, someone determined there wasn't repentance, and then this was presented to the whole church, not for them to vote on whether they go and call them to repentance, but to challenge and encourage the church to go do that. So who's doing that? The leadership of the church is directing the congregation so that they might carry through this work of church discipline. And we, we saw that really very clearly in 1 Corinthians 5, where the church gathers, but Paul doesn't say, hey, look, now take a vote as to whether or not you want to do this church discipline. He says, I, as an apostle, I'm saying this is what's going to happen. Well, then with no apostles on the scene, it would be the elders who then have worked through the situation and present that to the church, not with the same authority as Paul, but simply calling to the church to say, look, now, since as, we, as we've worked through this issue, you need to go and call this person to repentance. Imagine what it would be like if in a church discipline situation, we, we gathered the whole church together and say, hey, here's all the, all the facts of the case. We'd like you to try to figure out whether or not we should do church discipline. It'd be an absolute unmitigated disaster and, and, and inappropriate to the work of the church. And yet, at the point where it has been determined where there is not repentance and there needs to be an entire church involvement, then that's stated to the church, go and call this man to repentance. And then if he does not, it says, if, if, he, if he doesn't respond even to the church, then you put him out. So the church has been involved, they know what's going on, and then the, those in the church that have sought out that man for repentance, it's clear that he has not repented, and so then he's set outside the church. So even a church discipline, I'm convinced you have the elders leading church agreeing or being in concert with them and then and then setting that person outside the church once the whole congregation has been informed uh, of, of the situation and the determination that there's not been repentance number three all right and this is important so that's the work that's the work of the elders positively 
right? And those are the things in which they have, again, a mediated authority through the word of God, under the work of Christ, and in concert or communication with the congregation, always, because they're part of the congregation. They're sheep, even as the rest of the sheep, even though they're acting as under shepherds. But I wanna be clear, number three here, that the elders do not have authority in the personal lives of the congregation. That is, again, over and above what the word of God would be. If, some, if they go into someone's home and they're, you know, someone is lying to someone else, they could say, stop lying, all right? That, that's appropriate, right? But to go into someone's home and say, well, you know, I don't like the way you've, you've arranged your house, or I don't think you ought to have that kind of entertainment, assuming that's not something that's base and evil. I don't think you ought to have that TV sitting there. I don't think you ought to be, the elders don't have authority to do that. Or someone says, hey, we'd like to move here or there. The elder does not have the authority to say, hey, you can't move. Now, they certainly could say, look, you need to look at some things and, and, and give counsel, as we'll see, but they have no authority in those places. And I want to make that very clear. The elders here at Grace do not take that authority. They have never taken that authority. We don't claim that kind of authority. We don't have it. In, a, in someone's personal life, as they're seeking to implement the truths of the word of God, in things that the church has not decided as a whole, and, and in things that is areas of church equipping, right? In their own personal lives, the elders carry no direct authority. Again, they might have weightiness in counsel, but they don't have direct authority. What kind of job someone should have, if they should move to a different location, what their schooling choices are, the exact kinds of entertainment they're allowed to pursue, and on and on and on. Those are conscience issues that, the, that an individual brings underneath the truth of the word of God and the elders can't speak to directly. However, that is not to say that elders can't or shouldn't give godly counsel as to how members of the congregation should conduct their spiritual lives. That certainly is appropriate because they're supposed to be qualified to have spiritual wisdom. And yet that counsel is not the same as mandate. That is, give counsel. It doesn't seem like it's wise for you to move there. You might want to consider some other things or, or possibly, you know, in your personal life, that relationship, I'm not, that doesn't seem wise to me. You've asked counsel, here are the scriptural principles. It doesn't seem wise, but that's not a binding mandate nor do the elders or should any counselor present it that way because scripture doesn't exactly say this is exactly how a relationship should be done or this is exactly where you can move or under what circumstances. So counsel is given. The counsel should bring weighty principles from the word of God, but it is counsel. And I think certainly this, this mandate or, or, or really command to counsel is everywhere in scripture. First Thessalonians 5.14, not only to the elders, but to really everyone in the church, says we urge you brethren, admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Counsel is to be given all the time. And that is to be brought by the principles of scripture, but it does not carry the same weight as the direct authority the elders have in overseeing the, the ministry of the word and the direct equipping ministries of the church. I hope that's very clear. And, and, and it sometimes can be difficult to, to see the difference. And it's very important that the difference is understood. Paul says, even in Colossians 1, 9, says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Is it day, the daily walk of an individual is something that the elders pray for and that they would give counsel in, but only in the areas that relate directly to the equipping ministry of the church as a whole and then to the direct commands of scripture as it is taught do the elders have, as it were, a, a, a more direct authority. So I hope that will be helpful. And, and it is our goal as elders to never abuse that kind of authority where we're like somehow speaking into someone's life and saying, because we're elders, your personal life has to be run the way that we say it ought to be run. It's inappropriate, and it would be something that would really be abusing the authority that elders have. Now, let's talk about more specifically the relationship of elders to the congregation. Because just th these are the things, and, and we've talked about it a little, but these are the areas in which elders uh, have, a, have a, a direct authority, places where they don't. We've talked about that in, in personal counsel. And now let's talk about how the, the two, the elders and the congregation work together. We've seen a couple of examples, but we haven't really fleshed it out, right? So this really needs to be uh, clear in the minds of both leaders in the congregation, right? And, and yet we, we can't define every aspect of, of this relationship. Some churches, for example, the Nine Marks model, it's advocated by Mark Dever, they believe that there should be a plurality of elders that guide the church, but that the congregation is the final authority to whom all church leadership must ultimately answer. If there's a difference of opinion on an issue between the elders and the voting majority of the congregation, the elders must yield. So it's elder leadership essentially with congregational authority. So the congregation has authority at any time with a, with a voting uh, majority to overturn the directions of or the uh, 
suggestions of the elders. However, grace, it would see the elders as shepherds in constant communication with the congregation, having accountability to the congregation, but holding a final authority to make decisions where there might be disagreements between the congregation and the eldership. So therefore, we don't take votes as to, okay, we've decided this. If the majority of the congregation agrees with us, we'll go ahead and do it. Our goal would be to never present anything that the majority of the congregation wouldn't agree with. I mean, that would be foolish of us as elders. Right? And yet we would say that if there were to be a difference of opinion, that ultimately it would be the elders who, who, have, that, who have the final say when it comes to that. Well, let's flesh that out a little bit, right? Two different models, both good and godly men hold both models, right? And yet we would say that the second one, that is how the elders function in saying, look, this is ultimately what the church is gonna do is the best and most biblical one. But first, the elders must work in concert with the congregation. See, it's, it's often held against this model. Look, well, the elders will then just steamroll the congregation, not asking them what they, what they want. First, again, first and foremost, that would be absolutely foolish. How long is a church gonna last if the elders are constantly doing things that the church doesn't agree with and that most of the church doesn't agree with? You're not gonna have a church. I mean, there's lots of ways to vote. One of them is with your feet. And boom, we're, I mean, we're gone. So it would be a foolish group of elders that would constantly be presenting things that the church doesn't agree with. And again, even in, even in structure, they certainly should never be presenting anything that is untrue from scripture. So they have to work in concert with the congregation, and this has to be through sacrificial service. Elders are humble servant leaders. This idea that they then carry a final authority to make a decision if there's any difference doesn't mean that they have, have any mandate to be arrogant, to assert their authority inappropriately, or to take any other than the authority that they're directly given. First Peter 5, which I've already read several times, the last part of it, verses 3 and 4, it says they are to exercise their oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the, to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is humble servant leadership. It carries authority. Those two are not opposite things. And this is what the world seems to say. If, if you have any kind of authority, you can't be humble and you can't be a servant. Those two go together. Jesus had full and total authority. He was a humble servant who washed the feet of his disciples. So authority should be, any kind of authority ought to be, must be humble and servant-minded. The elders must seek to accomplish the will of God for the flock out of their deep love for the Lord and of those they minister to. There's a voluntary service that eagerly meets the needs of God's people without any thought of gain for themselves. All leaders are to be humble examples of complete dedication and sacrifice, serving and laying down their lives in reverence for the Lord. Certainly the elders should be highly motivated by the fact that the chief shepherd, the, old, the one who was ultimately humble, who humbled himself to the point of death, who gave his life to purchase that very congregation, if the elders are to stand before him, they had best be humble. They had best have been servants as he was, even, again, as they exercise the proper kinds of authority within the church. So there is a humble servant and servant mindset and a sacrificial service by which they lead and by which then they, they enable the congregation, they draw them along into the decisions that they make. Arrogant, forceful leaders have to batter the congregation and have to work through political means to try to get people to agree with them. Well, humble servant leaders should be as they communicate and minister to the congregation, the, the, the relationship should be such that as they make decisions and assert the rightful kinds of authority that the, their relationship is so good with the congregation that there is favor on all sides. Also, it's incredibly important that there be lots of good communication, not just sacrificially serving, but also continually communicating. And this is related to the priesthood of the believer. You see, every person in this church that's a true believer has the spirit of God living inside of them. They have the ability to know and understand scripture. They have the ability to give input with their gifts and to, and to work along, alongside of the elders. And so that priesthood, that, that, the fact that every believer has something to offer and add has to be carefully remembered, understood, and cultivated by the, the elders of any congregation. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It begins with the apostles, they did, but then extends to every believer because we have the scriptures and we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. 
And so it is very important that the elders continually communicate with the congregation, receiving back their ideas, cultivating their gifts, and then seeing that their gifts are used within the body. The elders do not have the giftedness necessary to make sure that the body comes to maturity. They equip the saints to do that. And to do that, they must receive back from the saints in, uh, helpful uh, both encouragements and ideas and thoughts as the elders work through any particular issue. So they are to uh, inform and solicit input from the church body. We saw that in Acts 6 already. I said, look, this is what we think we need to do, but hey, you guys go pick seven men. You're capable of knowing who those men are in your midst. Bring them back. We'll approve them. And the whole church said, this is great. We'll all do it together. And they did. Look at Acts 15. We'll see another place where this happened. And here we see the progression of, of, of really apostles to then include elder leadership even in the church in Jerusalem. Again, this is, this is fascinating stuff. Acts chapter 15, they're having a, a huge discussion on the basis of whether or not, really the, the law should be, whether or not those who are, are Jewish believers particularly, or all believers, have to come back underneath at least certain portions of the Mosaic law. This is a, a seminal time in, in the discussion of the church and in the growth of the church. And so as they come together, right, they, all, they all come together, and, and the whole church essentially, beginning with the, with the leaders, right, has this discussion. So in verse Chapter 15, verse 1, some men came down from Judea, began teaching that the brethren, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas, so so the church determines that Paul and Barnabas should go up to the church in Jerusalem to the apostles and elders. Fascinating. And now they're both operating in concert together. The apostles are still there, some of them. They've now raised up elders within that church in Jerusalem, and they go up to have this discussion. When they, were, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. Notice that threefold issue. The congregation, the church, and you have the apostles and the elders. So some of the sect of the Pharisees stand up and say certain things. And then verse 6, the apostles and elders came together to look into the matter. This is fascinating. So the leadership of the church comes together and says, we need to solve this. Now, if you read through this passage, what you'll see is that the leadership was having this discussion. The church was aware of it. They were, they were, they were hearing the discussions going on. They weren't directly the ones making these decisions, but they understood this was happening and all the things were going on as the leaders of the church worked through this issue. All right, and so they listen to all the things go- that are going on. James finally stands up and, and makes a determination. Right, he works his way all the way through it, gives all the biblical principles for it. And then he says in verse 22, it says, then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to choose men from them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas and, si- and Silas, leading men among the, among the brethren. So the elders ultimately make a determination, James being their spokesman, about how this is to be dealt with. Then they send out representatives to the rest of the congregations, not because the church in Jerusalem had some kind of oversight power in an ongoing way, but because that's where the apostles were primarily Right? And then as they make this decision, they're saying, look, here's, as, as the churches are being established, here is a kind of fundamental teaching that needs to be incorporated into the rest of the churches. But notice that it is the elders and the apostles who make this decision. Then the whole church agrees, hey, this is what we, we should do. Again, the church in agreement, they send out the, these apostolic emissaries, essentially, and deliver these, the, uh, the message to the rest of the congregations. So... They, as, they, as they read this message, as they send it out, it comes from the leadership and yet is agreed to by the entire congregation. In fact, if you look at something like Colossians 4.17, it gives a command to the entire congregation to hold people accountable to do the work of the Lord. To say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. That's a letter written to everybody. And the whole congregation comes alongside this guy Archippus and says, look, do your ministry. So again, the, the congregation is involved as decisions are made, they're in agreement with those decisions, that's the goal, and that the body collective is behind the decisions that are then really initiated by and and made final determination by the elder leadership body. Now remember, the body collective is vital. So both the communication to the body, the body being being directed uh, in these issues by the elders, and then also the the giftedness of the body being used. 1 Corinthians 12.4. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, variety of ministries in the same Lord, variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. All the members, true members of the body of Christ have the spirit of God. And so the elders in communicating with them acknowledge that and work with the body of Christ in order to to make decisions, 
and then to press forward in what the Lord would have. And as I mentioned, the, the, ga- the gathering of the church as a, as a corporate body is certainly necessary for some functions. That is to be informed and then to be, to be in agreement with what the decisions that are being made. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 5 and in Matthew 18. So elders cultivate the affirmation. They must cultivate the affirmation of the entire body. Another important thing to know here, so underneath this, the elders work in concert with the congregation. Sacrificial service. They need to have godly communication because of the priesthood of the believers and because of the giftedness of all the members of the body. But also there is accountability that elders have to the to the church body. What is that accountability? Not that the church votes to overturn various things decided by the elders, but that the elders can and must be addressed if they are in sin through the process of church discipline. So 1 Timothy 5 says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Here is the, the accountability of elders to the congregation. They sin. Someone would go to them individually is the idea. And, and if they don't repent of that sin, then th- if this, this accusation is brought to the other elders. It's got to be at least two people to make sure that lots of spurious accusations are not given against elders. But then when that is investigated and determined to be true, that elder is confronted. If he doesn't repent, he's then confronted in front of the congregation. And I think the implication is he's set aside. So there certainly is an accountability through church discipline of the elders to the congregation. They cannot simply do as they please. Well, then finally here, we would say, so that's the elders working in concert with, communicating with, understanding the giftedness of, cultivating all the gifts and strengths of, of the body as those who are, uh, who are priests before the Lord as in we now all have the right to to enter directly into his presence in prayer and to have the giftedness of of Christ or the the spirit of God given to us. But now this idea of the final exercise of authority and decision-making. So the elders exercise final authority and decision-making. Why would this be? Well, Well, here are the reasons. It is clear that New Testament elders are required to have specific qualifications which make them suitable for leadership. That's 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Every believer should have those qualifications. That's the goal but the elders have to have those. And so in light of those qualifications, it does not seem appropriate for the congregation as a whole, many of whom may not yet share those qualifications to have the ultimate responsibility for decisions that are made. If you have church discipline for doctrinal error and you have those that don't don't yet have the knowledge necessary to determine if there is doctrinal error, well then why should they get together to, to vote and say, well, we don't think that ought to be the case? So essentially it undoes the qualifications of elders. Why even have them have qualifications if those who aren't required to have those qualifications can then overturn the decisions that they make. Additionally, the authority ultimately is given to the elders, not the congregation, in verses like Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now again, that doesn't mean submit to them, in, as we've already said, in which they try to make determinations in your, pub- in your personal life, or tell you what to do in other areas, but submit to them as they are teaching the word of God and as they are directing the ministries of the church as a whole for the equipping of the saints for the works of service. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says the same. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders. Again, younger men being addressed as the ones who would struggle the most with coming underneath any kind of elder authority. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.12, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So because those particular, the idea of submitting has to do with, if you disagree, you come underneath. Since that is given to the elders directly, we would then say that the final decision would rest with them if there is disagreement. The goal is that there would never be disagreement. Remember also, if if you're considering the, the voting method or model, that a democratic vote never represents the entire church. In fact, it always represents what? The most vocal minority in the church. Right, of people that may or may not even be qualified. So all believers, while priests in the body of Christ, as it were, are not qualified to lead the flock. And so therefore, those who have to have these qualifications should be, at the end of the day, those who make that final decision. The elders in Acts 20, 28 were, were given this responsibility that they were to shepherd the flock and they were to protect the flock. It seems to make little sense if those elders were, were given that responsibility that they would hand it back to the congregation to be the ones that say, hey, we think the flock ought to be protected in this way, but we're not sure. Or that can be overturned at any, at any given time because the elders have to stand before the Lord to say, we protected the flock. We guarded the flock as you gave us 
that responsibility. That's what Hebrews 13, again, says, submit to them because they give an account. So the nature of elder leadership in the local church is a delicate balance of wise and loving direction from the elders, supported and encouraged by helpful, submissive responsiveness from the congregation. Both elders and congregation move together in concert to accomplish the work that God has given the church to do with the elders having the final authority in decision-making. That being said, it would be foolish and unwise for a group of elders to regularly, if ever, make a decision with which the majority of the church disagreed. This would usually indicate an unhealthy disconnect between elders and congregation, meaning that the elders were doing a poor job, most often, of communicating and shepherding. Now, if you want to see how that gets fleshed out in even more detail, you can go to our church website and look underneath the, our uh, the bylaws of Grace Community Church. It all gets laid out. All right, how does voting work on the elder board? Because we, we do vote on the elder board. That is, we have to be in full agreement. There's to be a 100% uh, agreement before anything is carried out on the elder board and some other things that happen. So if you want that more fleshed out, you can do that. As I mentioned, you can also listen to the messages that I gave to the youth from Titus uh, chapter 1, verses really uh, 5 through 7 to see how this fleshes out even more. But to kind of then finish out here, in this distinctive, that is where you have elder leadership in concert with the congregation, with the elders having then the, the, the final authority to make a decision, what are the most important things about this leadership that we would say, these are the, are the things kind of in order of importance that should be true in any church if it's gonna have godly leadership, right? First, I would say absolutely essential is that the elders are qualified, that there are elders and that they have the proper qualifications. To have church leadership that is not properly qualified dooms any church, and it doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter what denomination, the elders must be qualified. And if, if they are not, then that church will be harmed. So qualified elders, uh, we would put, I would put as the, the primary issue when it comes to church leadership. A plurality of elders would be second. That is that there's more than one. There are multiple, hundreds, thousands upon thousands of churches which run with just one man who's considered to be the elder. And then you have deacons and other things. I'm not saying that every one of those churches is ungodly and dangerous. I'm only saying that I'm convinced, and we're convinced from Scripture, that that is not the best model, and it does carry some dangers with it. So, qualified, certainly if there's just one guy, he's got to be qualified. We would say then the best thing would be there isn't just one guy, there are multiple guys, a plurality of elders, that that's what the Scriptures teach. Next underneath that of importance is that the, those elders must be in charge of and faithfully carry out leadership, oversight, teaching, and equipping. That's what they do. They don't just manage the finances. They don't just make sure the building's doing all right. They, they don't just do structural things. Leadership, oversight, teaching, and equipping. So qualified elders, plurality of elders, leadership, oversight, teaching, and equipping. Then, and really, all, all these four come together. Elders working in concert and communication with the congregation. Elders who do not do that, who, who abuse the congregation through, through refusing to communicate, through holding only their own counsels and not drawing the congregation into that, harm a church. So those four, qualified elders, plurality, plurality of eldership, leadership, oversight, teaching, and equipping by elders, and elders working in concert with the congregation are primary. And then the one that I mentioned at the end that I think is important, certainly good and godly men differ on this one, or that we, we see as important here at Grace is that the elders would then have that final authority so we don't throw everything out to a vote. Again, there are churches that do that differently, who have elders whom we respect greatly. We don't think that that's that, that final, we think that final piece is important because it then enables those who are required to have the qualifications to lead and direct the church in a manner which grants some measure of authority. So that's the distinction, the Grace Community Church distinctive on eldership. If you have questions, thoughts, concerns, or comments, you can discuss some of those probably tonight in your fellowship groups, but also certainly to, to come if you have any thoughts on those things. But really, as we finish, just a couple of things. I hope and pray that you'll rejoice along with me at the plan of God to have a vibrant, growing body of believers that is able to accomplish the will of God as it has proper leadership, proper involvement, and as it steps forward to do God's work. And I would ask this, are you actively involved in working with the elders and with one another using your gifts for the building of the body of Christ. Elder leadership is to equip the saints, not to do the work of the saints. That's your work. We, we equip, and you're doing the work, and we do this together. And are you praying for, encouraging, and strengthening the leadership even as you grow and deepen in your own understanding of Scripture and exert the proper leadership as God has given you the, the sphere of influence that you have? Let's pray.
Father, thank you for the chance to just work our way through these scriptures this morning and to consider the importance of leadership, the importance of how this fleshes itself out in the church and here at Grace. And Lord, we ask that there would continually be a, a group of men qualified for leadership qualified as elders to accomplish the work that you've given us to do. And I pray that there would continually be a, a concert and unity between the elders and congregation, that we would constantly be working together to accomplish your work, and that as, as there is this joyful communication, as this joyful work goes forward, or that our church would be ever increasingly unified. They would take great delight in accomplishing this work together and equipping the saints and the saints being equipped and for accomplishing the work of God. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.